So I'm excited to be here. I uh, hope you guys enjoy the talk. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, different mechanisms for generalized machine learning that works across different tasks and different environments. So what do I actually mean by that? Well, we all know machine learning works really, really well um, in certain domains. So we've seen a lot of exciting progress, for example, in like image recognition. Everyone was pretty stoked about, for example, AlphaGo, learning to play Go. Um, so it works pretty well but in pretty limited domains. So it was a really big breakthrough uh, when uh, DeepMind trained AlphaZero that worked both uh, to play Go and to play chess, even though those are both board games. So going beyond that is almost like unheard of. So we really don't have any type of machine learning system that can solve multiple different problems at once. Um, and so what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, different ways to, to make some steps towards that. So um, the first project I'm gonna talk about uh, uses a multitask learning approach where you're trying to learn a classifier that can learn multiple related tasks at once and benefit uh, from the other tasks. Um, the second project I'm going to talk about uh, does a type of transfer learning where you first train on data and then you transfer what you've learned from the data to learning with reinforcement learning. And the final project I'm going to talk about is a reinforcement learning approach for multi-agent RL uh, where you use an intrinsic motivation mechanism. Uh, and so that basically is an incentive that might cause you to learn across multiple different types of problems. So I'll start with the multitask learning uh, talk. Um, so as John mentioned, uh, a lot of my early PhD was spent doing affective computing. So this is like a classic affective computing problem. What we want to do here is uh, predict people's well-being. So ideally, what we'd like to do is uh, gather some data unobtrusively from them, just passively from the way they're using their smartphone or if they're wearing any sort of wrist-worn physiological sensor, can we use that data? Send that to our server, do some super cool machine learning on it, and then ideally what we'd like to be able to do is predict that person's well-being in the future. So uh, we were working on next day prediction of their happiness, stress, and health. And so we think this could have a couple of important uh, benefits. So for one thing, if you get some type of well-being forecast, just like uh, if you get a weather forecast and you know it's going to rain, you can take an umbrella. If you get a forecast that says there's a 92% chance you're going to be stressed out tomorrow, maybe you can take some steps to help yourself with that. Maybe you can get fit in that extra yoga class, get a little extra sleep at night, do something to help yourself out. Um, the second important thing that we see coming out of this is being able to predict someone's uh, well-being over time gives you this nice history of their well-being. And ideally, if we could predict that their, their well-being is on a pretty negative trajectory, then we could guide some treatment and prevention efforts to be able to course correct away from transitioning into a, a problematic state like depression. So this is the, the high-end goal here. Um, so in order to serve this, we collected like a ton of data about people. Uh, we collected everything we could get from their smartphone. So we've got their daily location features everywhere they're going, whoever they're texting and calling. We've got physiological features from their wrist, their step count. We're asking them to fill out surveys. Did you drink alcohol? Did you drink caffeine? Did you exercise? Getting all of this rich data from all these people. And we actually published quite a few papers on this problem. We built elaborate websites to detect artifacts in your physiological data. We did a bunch of deep learning to fill in the missing data because it's noisy, all of this. And then if you look at the classification results of our best work, uh, we only get like 74% in predicting their happiness. So that's a little disappointing because I don't think that's like production level system. You can't really roll this out and give people accurate forecasts about their happiness if you're only getting 74% accuracy. And it's not just that we suck, I promise. If you look at the literature on happiness detection or prediction, so this is detection actually not predicting, uh, the accuracies range from like very low 55% to maybe 76% if you're lucky. Yes? Can you clarify what is enabled like as pitching? Is it the self-reported score? Yes. It is self-report, so they're actually self-reporting on a scale, and we're binarizing that. So it's basically you're happier or, or sadder than your average. So, yeah. Um, so these are also binary classification accuracies. So disappointingly low. So why can't we do better? And I actually don't think the answer is that we don't have enough rich data uh, for, the, for the person. I think there should be a lot of signal within the data we collected uh, for each individual. But I think the issue why can't we do better? Well, we're not accounting for individual differences. So people are actually very individualistic in what makes them feel stressed or what makes them feel happy. So one person might be perfectly happy sitting at home alone coding on a Friday night, and if they went to like a loud, crowded party, that would stress them out. 
but there's going to be another person who has the exact opposite reaction to the same stimuli. So if you shove both those people into the same machine learning classifier and you try to say, you spend Friday night at home alone, I'm gonna predict whether you're happy, you're not gonna get very good accuracy. So the aim of this project is to account for individual differences using multitask learning. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna treat predicting the well-being of each person as a task, so a, a classification problem, and that will allow us to customize a model for each person. But we don't actually have enough longitudinal data for each person to just train a separate classifier for each individual. Um, and also that would be a waste of the data. There might be some people that actually do relate well to each other, so we're, we're not using that efficiently. And then you can't generalize to a new person if you're training a new model each time. So what we do is we do this multitask learning approach which allows us to benefit from the statistical strength of the data from other people to the degree that they're related to the person we're trying to predict. Um, so the first model we used to do that, uh, I think is a good illustration of the whole concept. So we use a multitask learning uh, neural network model, which is shown here. So what we do is we have a giant network where the first few layers are shared feature extraction layers that take this high dimensional data from the person's day and try to compress it down into a good representation. So if we have all these features about who you're texting, can the network learn to compress this down into an aggregated measure of, for example, social support? Then what the next part of the network does is for each person, they ha each person has a few neurons, a couple of layers, that maps that shared feature representation into a prediction that's customized for them. So if you got a lot of social support, what do we think your well-being might be? So that's our neural network model. We also use a few other models. Um, one is this hierarchical Bayesian model uh, that uh, is based on Dirichlet process priors. So in this example, each person draws their classifier weights from the shared Dirichlet process prior. And that DP prior uh, induces a nice clustering over people. So uh, it clusters people together that have similar decision boundaries. So you actually get only a small number of different decision boundaries that fit the whole data set of people. Um, and it's nice because it's a non-parametric soft clustering, so each person can belong to different clusters to varying degrees, and we don't have to decide the number of clusters in advance, it's gonna learn that directly from the data. So that's uh, this uh, hierarchical Bayes model. And then the final model we looked at was this multi-task, multi-kernel learning model. So it's basically based on uh, individual SVMs per person, least squared SVMs, but where the kernel function is going to be broken down by the different data modalities that we have. So we have location data, we have texting data, we have uh, physiology data. Uh, each of those data modalities gets its own kernel function, and you combine those kernels together in a weighted sum. And what gets personalized is the weights that each person places on the different modalities. So maybe for a certain person, the weather has a lot of importance, and for another person, that's not the case. So each person gets their own weights, and the weights are regularized globally so that they can't diverge too much from the weights of other people. So that gives you some information about how other people's weights work to guide the search for your own weights. Um, and we saw this with expectation maximization. So these are the three models, but how well did this actually work? Well, the first thing we did was we tested the single task learning, traditional machine learning approach, where we'd use one classifier for everyone. And we look at the different equivalents to all these algorithms, so we've got an SVM, a neural network, et cetera. And you see that the accuracies from doing this single task learning are disappointingly low again. So maxing out at 68%, which again is typical of the literature, but not very exciting. The next thing we do is we test multitask learning but where we do the multiple, multiple tasks are the different related mood outcomes. So essentially, each person is still lumped into the same classifier, but now we're trying to say predicting happiness might be similar to predicting stress. So is there any gain from just using these models, using this multitask learning approach over related tasks in general? And we see that not really. Like maybe for the neural network, there's some regularizing effect, but just using these techniques doesn't get you there. What does get you there is using the, these techniques to personalize the models to each individual. Um, so when we treat uh, the predicting the mood or the stress of different people as related tasks, then we see quite large performance gains, actually up to about 20% in some cases. And uh, at the time we did this research, that led us to state-of-the-art performance in predicting these self-reported outcomes. So 82% for health, stress, and 78% for happiness. So we were pretty excited about this. And uh, what's cool is you can actually look into some of these models and interpret what's going on in the models. So this is the kernel weights on the different modalities learned for the multitask, multi-kernel learning classifier. 
And we have this parameter in that classifier that regularize, regularizes how similar the tasks have to be. And so you can see that for the stress, uh, it's, it's very heavily regularized so that actually all of the people's uh, weights are very similar in predicting stress. Now this is a small population of undergrads from a certain institution, uh, so we think maybe their stress is affected similarly by these features. Um, but if you look at their mood, it's actually pretty individualistic. So uh, for some one person here, weather is incredibly predictive of their mood. But for other people, it really doesn't matter. The weather is not affecting them. Similarly, uh, people's location features are really important for some individuals, and basically not at all for others. So we think this, again, emphasizes why personalization is important. And to really make that point, this is one of my favorite findings. Um, this is, these are the clusters that were automatically learned by the hierarchical Bayesian model. And so we did some post hoc analysis to understand who got clustered together. And we found that the first cluster, cluster zero, is kind of like the average person. They don't differ from the group uh, significantly on any metric. But the second cluster differs significantly in that they have a higher GPA and higher conscientiousness. And actually, they also place a very high weight on the likelihood of their day, which is a measure of how routine their location patterns are. So they're uh, less stressed when they're more routine, they're very conscious, they have high GPA. This is kind of like the studious cluster, if you will. Um, cluster two is extroverted, and they tend to have lower physical health. So I don't know what these undergrads, these extroverted undergrads are doing that lowers their physical health, but I guess you could make some guesses. But um, let's look at how they actually differ in their weights. So the extroverted cluster, we see that if they spend a lot more time on campus and they're texting a lot of people, especially late at night, that's actually making them feel less stressed the next day. So they feel good if they're doing these things. However, for the studious cluster, uh, they actually have the exact opposite reaction. So if they're spending a ton of time on campus and they're texting a ton of people late at night, that's making them feel more stressed out the next day. So you can see that if you lump these two people into the same classifier and you just try to say, hey, you were on campus late at night or texting people late at night, I'm gonna try to predict your stress, you would not do a good job. So you really need to have this uh, personalization to break these people apart into their different reaction styles. Um, so we uh, followed this up. Uh, that was predicting, as you mentioned, uh, binary mood. But now we followed this up with trying to predict their uh, stress level. So they're actually reporting their stress on a 0 to 100 scale. Can we regress and predict that exact level to, to be more accurate? Um, so we uh, added another approach uh, using Gaussian processes. Uh, so Gaussian processes, this is the normal Gaussian process. Basically, you have this smoothing prior over data points where you use similar data points to predict something that doesn't differ too much from the, the ones next to it. Uh, in order to make this personalized, we take a domain adaptation approach where we, ju we just adjust the mean and uh, variance uh, in our posterior based on the data of a new person. So you have this prior learned from everyone else, and then you adapt it specifically to this new person to make personalized predictions. And then to do, yes? So yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. here, yeah, so this is like taking a whole target person's data, it's like a whole kernel of all of their data and adapting, so it adapts more strongly to their data specifically. You're gonna move farther from your prior learn from other people. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, the neural network is very easy to do regression, you just change the loss function, you don't have to do anything else. E deep learning is very fun and easy, so. Um, how did, well did this actually do? Uh, we look at the mean absolute error for the, the multitask neural network. We see that it improves significantly. This happens for the GP as well, uh, but not as consistently. So if we dig into how this works, for the neural network, the personalized version performs better for almost all of the participants. So personalization is really, uh, is really helping in most cases. This is true for the GP as well, but only for 40 out of 69 participants. But um, what's really interesting about this is looking at the model fit. So uh, if we look at, for example, this uh, graph on the right. So what we're seeing here is the, true, the ground truth health that this person reported over 30 days ordered by the, the magnitude. And you can see that the predictions of the non-personalized model, this, uh, these stars there, or the triangles, blue triangles, uh, tend to be pulled towards the group average, which is pretty unsurprising. So they're just being dragged down by what is typical of the rest of the group, even though this person considers themselves very healthy. Um, but when you do this personalization, the model is more able to accurately trace the trend of this person's individual data. 
So when we compute another metric, which is the intra-class correlation, which actually accounts for how well you're fitting the trend of the data as well as the uh, error that you're getting, um, we see that a huge improvement from personalization. So up to 162%, including for the Gaussian process. So again, we think personalization is really important for predicting these type of individualistic <laughs> outcomes. Any questions about this project before I move on to the next one? Yes. Can you say more when you think this kind of approach, how, how can we tell if a problem will benefit it by this approach uh, rather than a standard, the standard kind of approach you try to break the game? Yeah, so if there's a high degree of inter-individual variability in outcome. So if there's a lot of very different phenotypes, if you will, in the way people respond to the same features that you have. It's strange though, because the features, you still only have the features, right? So, so you're saying, if the coefficient on some features is heavily dependent on other features. If the coefficient is heavily dependent on the identity of where the data came from, so the person's identity. So you basically, there's, a, there's kind of a hierarchical structure to this problem where you have like, you have hundreds of data points across all people, 30 data points per person, and like person identity, right? We also look at this um, where you can cluster people. Was there 100 data points across all people, and then what was the 30s? We have more than 100, but uh, the 30 is like per individual. You have 30 data points. What does it mean to have a data point across all people? Uh, I'm saying you're pooling everyone. Yeah. You have hundreds of data points. Yeah. But it, for each individual, you actually know that 30 of the data points came specific, specifically from them. Yeah. Um, we also looked at like clustering people based on their demographic information, well, their personality. So we clustered based on big five and gender, and then did the same thing, and the results replicate. So essentially, like if you have more background information about constant traits of the person that can um, inform your predictions, that can that can help. Um, yes. Yeah. How sensitive is this to class imbalance? Basically, the types of people. Ah, uh, so we kind of uh, get away from that by specifically making our partition, so we're doing binary class labels in the beginning. We say like if the average mood is actually higher than 50, then we just do a median split. So we didn't test it with class imbalance. We made sure the classes were balanced, essentially. Do you mean classes of different kinds of people? Ah, so if there was like a very underrepresented, so you're like a total outlier, you don't fit in with the extroverts or the studious people. That's a great question. I haven't, um, well actually one thing that could answer that is that I think for the hierarchical Bayesian model in particular, um, where is that beautiful thing here? Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yeah, so if you see this slide, you can see that a couple of individuals here belong to sort of all the clusters in varying degrees. Um, and so there's only like three people that are, are like that. Um, and we think maybe that helps to give the model enough power to capture them. But I haven't like delved into looking at who is an outlier and what happened to them. Yeah. Maybe there's a misfit cluster. A misfit cluster, yeah. exactly, yeah. <laughs> what if the cluster's too big, are they really misfits? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Very interesting. So in more classical statistical terms, you could account for the individual by putting a random intercept. To a mixed effects you, model. You could account for the individual a by random intercept. Ah. To a mixed effects model, right? Mm -hmm. how, have you tried to compare how your model fares compared to that? Against a mixed effects model? No, I haven't tested that. That would be interesting. Yeah. Sorry, I realize I'm supposed to repeat the questions that only came to me now. Um, any other questions before I move on? Yeah. Can you suggest you can use some prior information about person to cluster them in the same way yeah. as they used by their but uh, uh, did you try just to put this information to some uh, standard classifier uh, together with all collected data? So maybe it would help classifier so you are automatically how to classify different people. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, you have this demographic information, like what's their personality? Could you just append that as a feature, for example, to the neural network model and hope that it would sort it out and like learn a different bias for different personalities or something like that? I believe we did try that and we didn't see as strong of an effect but I don't have the, the numbers for you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's go to the next part of the talk. So I think this might be a little more um, uh, relevant for you guys here at the Broad. So uh, let's ignore this title. I never liked this title, I thought it was bad. 
This is the transfer learning from data to RL. Um, but the application that I'm looking at here is actually a drug discovery application. Um, so it turns out that you can encode molecules as sequences of strings using this SMILES encoding. So you can see amphetamine here is this sequence CCNCC, da da da. So we know that deep learning is really good at modeling sequences. So wouldn't it be cool if we could just shove all those known drugs, 250,000 known drugs, into a deep neural network and then try to generate new sequences and see if they turn out to be cool drugs? Um, so this is an idea that several people had. Um, uh, but the issue with doing this approach is that in previous work, there's often quite a low yield of uh, sequences that decode into valid molecules. So sometimes even less than 1% of the sequences you decode from your neural network turn out to be an interesting molecule. And even if they were a molecule, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be a good drug. Um, and it turns out that we actually can measure quantitatively certain desirable drug-like properties. Um, so for example, uh, we can look at the water octanol partition coefficient, or the log p score of a molecule, which basically says how likely it is to affect the human body. Um, we can compute a quantitative estimation of drug likeness, which is a score about how uh, much it looks like a drug. By the way, I'm not a, not a biomed person, so if I mess any of this up, I apologize. Um, we can also uh, compute the synthetic accessibility score, which is, should be how easy it is to manufacture. So this is really nice, and we would like to be able to directly optimize for these scores while generating these molecules. Um, but the issue with that is that they are non-differentiable. So you can't backprop through the quantitative estimation of drug likeness score. It's just some code uh, that doesn't allow you to do that. So this gets me a little excited, because one of my passions is reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is this paradigm that can deal with this type of problem. So reinforcement learning, uh, you have an AI agent. It takes actions, and it sends those to an environment. And the environment uh, figures out how good that action is and sends back a reward. And the environment, you don't have to be able to uh, compute gradients through it. It's a non-differentiable environment. Often it's like an Atari simulator. So the environment is like computing some score of your action and giving you back this reward. Um, so what we can do is we can uh, treat uh, the scores, the, the drug likeness scores of our molecules as a reward, and we can optimize for that. Um, using a paradigm in this paper, uh, Q-learning, which is a reinforcement learning paradigm where you're trying to optimize the total expected future reward you get from taking a certain action now and continuing on into the future till the end of the, end of the episode. Um, so what, every time we're taking action is basically which character we're placing in the sequence. And we don't want to just greedily maximize the drug likeness score at every character. We want to maximize the drug likeness of the whole sequence. So that's what we're trying to learn here is this, is this Q store, score. Um, so we want to do reinforcement learning on these drug-like properties, maybe like this log P score. But the sad thing is that these are exploitable. So the ultimate log P score can be obtained by just spamming carbon, 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 carbon. So you get a very high uh, score for just doing C, 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 C. So we can't just do reinforcement learning on its own because uh, we wouldn't get very interesting sequences. So what can we do? Um, what we're going to do is combine training these recurrent neural networks on data using maximum likelihood estimation, so training a sequence model as in prior work, and then we're going to transfer, do transfer learning to transfer from that to optimizing with reinforcement learning. Now, uh, just to give you a bit of background on sequence generation with RNNs. Actually, how many people have done RNNs before sequence generation? A couple of people. Okay, great. I, I'll still go through it. Um, basically, this is a tradition. This is like a the simplest possible traditional neural network. Let's say here's your input, here's your output. Y. So you're going through some layers. These are neurons. Um, to make this recurrent, uh, to be able to deal with sequences, you make a feedback loop. Uh, so basically the output of this neuron, this yellow neuron at time step t, is fed back into itself at time step t plus one. So that's what makes it recurrent. Now you need to do uh, more fancy things than that, like uh, the, it has to have a cell state and a forget gate so it can choose when to erase its own contents, otherwise you're gonna have vanishing exploding gradients. I won't get into all that now. Uh, we use a long short-term uh, memory network in our work in LSTM. Um, but the issue with sequence generation with LSTMs, although it's really fun, it has, uh, oh sorry, this is the network rolled out in time. Um, it has a lot of issues. So this is an LSTM trained on Wikipedia data um, by Alex Graves, who's very good at training these things, although it was a while ago. 
Um, and you can see that while it's uh, learned some pretty impressive uh, grammar and uh, mark markdown structure, markup, sorry, um, from Wikipedia, it is not making any sense. Like, what is this talking about? It's talking about sausages, submarines, sisters. What? It's total, there's no structure here. So you can't rely on just an LSTM to really capture high level structure of the problem. Um, so that's one problem. The other issue is that the sequences trained with maximum likelihood are often boring and generic. So this is me training a dialogue model to generate language. You can see that it just keeps saying, I don't know, I'm sorry, and I don't know what you want. So I don't know what it's trying to tell me, but uh, <laughs> you can see that what, what's happening here is that these sequences are kind of very likely under any input. I don't know sort of works in response to any response, any input. Um, so if you just maximize the likelihood of the data, uh, you tend to sort of collapse on only a few sequences. So that's not very interesting. So what we'd like to do is improve both of those problems, the lack of variety and the lack of structure with reinforcement learning. Um, but uh, there's an issue with that as well. So people have looked at this problem before, particularly for machine translation. So what the typical approach is to do is to train on data first, train your RNN, and then in a second step, just train with RL. But the issue is that neural networks suffer from a pretty known problem called catastrophic forgetting. So if you train on task A, and then you train on task B, task B will completely erase what you learn uh, from task A. So they're just like Homer Simpson. Every time he learns something new, it pushes something out of his brain. That's what a neural network is. Um, so that's an issue with this previous paradigm. Uh, the other issue is that if you're going to erase what you learn from data with reinforcement learning, your reinforcement learning function better be pretty good. And the issue is that in a lot of domains, it's not. So we already saw that our reinforcement learning function, like log p, is very exploitable. We don't want to just rely purely on RL because it's not going to get us there. So we need, to, we need some influence from the data as well. And we also want our sequences, like I said, to have some variety and some randomness. So what we do is we take a little bit of a different approach. Um, so we do the typical thing where we train uh, an RNN first on data, uh, and then in the second step, we use that RNN to initialize the parameters of our reinforcement learning uh, Q networks. However, the interesting thing that we do is we keep a copy of this model that was trained on data, and we use this as like a, a strong prior over what the sequences should look like. Uh, and here I'm calling it a reward RNN. And the reason I'm calling it that is it's gonna help us shape our reward function. So in particular, our rewards are gonna include not only the task-specific reward, like our log p score, but they're also gonna uh, include a term based on the probability that our original model placed on this uh, according to the data. So we can treat the model that we learned on data as this prior over what is a likely looking sequence, and we want to penalize sequences that our RL model generates that are unlikely under the data. So that if they don't look like a real drug, not good. Um, so that, to be more specific, what we're actually doing here is our reward function is our sum coefficient times our task-specific reward minus the KL divergence of our reinforcement learning Q model, our model policy Q, from our prior P. And as I mentioned, P is this probability uh, learned about the data. So that's our model. Um, we do this in a few different, yeah, you have a question? Did I hear your question? Ah, yes. Um, I, it's always problematic for me. I used to, I always struggle with how do you tune this C? I mean, ah, this yes. is non-trivial because you're trading off things. It's true. Yeah, so this is a, I'm, I'm a deep learning person, so I'm not as afraid of extra hyperparameters, but I actually did explore tuning this pretty thoroughly, and it seems to be fairly robust to different, uh, even orders of magnitude of the, of the parameter C. But it does depend on your specific problem. So if you know that your reward function is pretty good and your data is pretty bad, then you should rate, weight it towards the reward function. Conversely, you sh could change it if you, if you know your data is better than the rewards. So um, I'm actually gonna show this not only on drug discovery, but on a second problem where we tune the C differently, and we, we see that it's, it's fairly robust. Yeah. Um, any other questions while I'm paused? Yeah. I just wonder, on which step do you take into account the syntax of smile? Like, sometimes you have to, like, generate some sequences that are compatible with the syntax. Yeah, we do, um, because uh, as I mentioned, like the syntax, like that's what I meant by uh, valid molecules, a low yield of valid molecules in the beginning. Um, we were initially just penalizing it heavily if the final sequence was not valid, but we actually started adding a reward where it, it assesses the validity throughout the sequence, um, and, and it's, it's getting penalized if it's not valid during. Yeah. If I remember correctly, sometimes when, even when the molecule generates 
the stock compatible, it's not compatible with your sleep tax, but that might still be a legit small one you can see in the slides. Uh, I, I just wonder, on, is there any kind of like slack you can get to these from the offer? That's oh, that's cool. cool. Well, if you had more knowledge of um, chemistry, you could probably do a much better job than I did. I just went, does the smiles decoder think it's good? Yes, no. So, so you could probably come in and, and add that kind of slack is what you were saying. Yeah, um, good question. Any other things before I keep going? Yeah? Uh, the reward function here is being learned right, in the process as well. Oh, this is given by our uh, code that detects like the synthetic accessibility, the log p. So you're you're learning. So you're taking that as known. Yes, models. exactly. Okay. The other question was, um, there's been a lot of work on representation learning on molecules that tries to you know have a structure that is maybe more geometric, more um, mm. less string-like, more molecule-like. So yeah. you know, sort of graph convolutional networks and that sort of thing. Cool. Do you, oh, okay. So that reaction is that's interesting. Yeah. But, well, you, but you haven't you haven't sort of tied it together with this. Yeah. So this work was from 2017. The big graph nets uh, explosion is was happening after that. But graph nets do seem to be pretty powerful and have been very successful in a number of domains. Um, the, uh, interestingly, if you're into the structure v end to end debate, graph nets build in a lot of structure and perform very well. Um, so that could definitely be something to explore. Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, any other questions? All right, let's keep going. So uh, that was the reward. Um, I'm going to just breeze through this. These are different ways of implementing Q-learning with respect to this uh, reward. So the straight up silliest, obvious thing you can do is just add the log probability of your prior into your reward function, basically like that. A cooler thing you can do is like an entropy regularization where you um, also subtract out the uh, log Q and do a log sum exp uh, to learn the function, and that's entropy regularized, so it keeps it more random, um, which we think was important. Um, G learning is this uh, method where you directly mix in the prior when taking an action. So instead of like learning a policy and acting from that, you, your policy is always multiplied by the prior. And what that does is it keeps it a little closer to your original prior. So uh, if you're curious about this, I would recommend looking at the paper. Um, but let's look at how this actually performed on the results. So in drug discovery, it works, yay. Um, so comparing to your baseline RNN, uh, we see a higher percentage of valid molecules. The molecules that are generated have log, higher log P score, uh, better synthetic accessibility, and uh, we also added a ring penalty uh, based on prior work for having too many carbon rings. I might be forgetting this, but um, it also improved on that. So that's nice, but what's really exciting is that it's kind of unsurprising that the reinforcement learning would improve on the metrics it's optimizing, but you can't tell from these metrics, like again, whether it's spamming CCC, um, and we see that it's not. So uh, these are some example molecules generated by Sequence Tutor, and they look more like real molecules in the data, and so we're excited about that. Um, the second uh, problem that I tried this on is a music generation problem. Um, so you can treat songs like, I think this, before it got scrambled, was, uh, da, 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 I don't know, I don't remember what the song was, but um, <laughs> yeah, you can uh, treat that as a sequence of notes and train on data to try to learn to generate human-like music. But again, you have the same problem, unstructured, boring songs. So could we use reinforcement learning to build in some structure based on the rules of music theory? Um, so that was what I tried to do one summer internship. And uh, I started coming up with some really silly rewards based on my like 10 years ago piano lesson knowledge. Uh, so I started with like the, the song should stay in key, start on the tonic note, not repeat notes too many times. And I was a little motivated to do this because a common failure mode of LSTMs is that they love to repeat the same token over and over. Um, but I was very fortunate that my colleague gave me this book on how to do 18th century counterpoint. And the very first rule of doing that is Avoid excessive repeated notes. So I was very happy to be able to theoretically justify my hacky rewards, um, so that was nice. Uh, using that book, I also came up with a bunch of other uh, rewards about what makes nice melodies, um, including using like more harmonious intervals. If you take a leap in the composition upwards, you should eventually resolve it downwards, et cetera. So we uh, optimized the model train on data with these rewards. And we see that the sequence tutor models, again, improve on these rewards, which is kind of unsurprising if the reinforcement learning is doing anything. Um, but the real question is, does it actually sound better? So here's a straight up RNN just trained on a bunch of songs uh, 
let's see how you think it sounds. So it's pretty boring and it's kind of unstructured. It's not really that interesting. If you train with this G learning, which directly mixes the prior with the uh, RL model, uh, it sounds a little random. So it's still not adhering that much to the RL structure because again, it's got to stay close to the prior. So basically, it's just spread. It's, it looks like it's just sped up the prior. Now, if you train with the psi learning. more like it's adhering to these basic rules that I applied. And then here's an example from the Q learning. So it sounds, it sounds better. I mean, we got some feedback. It sounded a little like a toothpaste jingle. But I, I think for, for the music generation at the time, this was kind of cool. The music generation FYI has gotten so much better since then. Uh, if you've seen like the transformer samples, they're really impressive. Um, but basically, we're seeing that this model is helping, um, but what, oh, sorry, that was exciting. Okay, we did an evaluation, turns out humans do like the sequence tutor's compositions better, very nice, but the thing that I'm most excited about is this graph. So um, what you're seeing here is all of these models were initialized with the weights of the prior that was trained on data. So we trained the model on data, that's the RNN, and we initialize all these models here with its exact weights, and then we measure the, um, probability of the compositions that it's generating under the prior. So how similar to the prior is it? And you can see that when you train with reinforcement learning only, so you don't do the sequence tutor thing, um, you immediately diverge from the prior pretty strongly. And actually, this line is the line of randomness with respect to the prior. So this would be like a totally d divorced from the prior. And you can, so basically you can see that the RL only model totally diverged from what it was initialized with we see catastrophic forgetting. So it's forgotten everything from the data. Whereas if you train with the sequence tutor models, we see that the catastrophic forgetting is ameliorated. So it's not forgetting everything it learned from the data, although it is adjusting away from the prior. Um, so we think that's pretty promising. Uh, so in conclusion for this paper, uh, you can optimize for task-specific rewards with reinforcement learning, but you can still maintain the information you learned from the data and encourage some diversity in your generated samples. Uh, and we think this uh, approach is really important when either your data set is incomplete, imperfect, or biased, or your model is just not able to capture it in an interesting way. I don't think RNNs are the final solution to capturing uh, uh, a data distribution of sequences. And then secondly, uh, if you're not able to design a sufficiently good reward function, then you can't rely on it entirely either. So you need to balance these two uh, sources of information. And the code is here if you ever want to use it. Actually, there's code available for the other project too if you want to email me. So any questions about the second project? Yes. So um, just thinking, you know, this sort of augmentation of your loss function with like a little reward that comes externally you know, from some known things that we want to be obeyed, like in music yeah. theory, staying key, not repeat, something like that. Yeah. Um, so that, it actually gives you more realistic examples. Is it, um, does it mean that we just couldn't train the, like a sequence generator from scratch because we didn't have enough data? Or does it mean that the, the, so basically, we needed to incorporate this bias because um, just sequence generation is just a bad, bad model for music generation. Like, why is just a bad model? That's a, that's a fantastic question. So just to repeat the question, you were asking, um, uh, do we absolutely need to build in this structure from prior theoretical knowledge like music theory, or could we, if we had a much better model and much more data, rely entirely on the model and the data to capture it? So this is like the big debate in like deep learning. Is it, can you just, do you need structure or not? Um, so I, you know, people have talked about this for days and days. Um, we do see that like better sequence models, like the transformer architecture that has come out recently, trained on 45 million web pages, I don't know if you saw GPT-2, is a pretty good language model. Um, and in, in some people would feel that that's a more scalable approach than trying to hand engineer structure, like particularly with these music theory rewards, um, that's not the best structure. Like I don't really know enough about music theory to do that well. Maybe just capturing it from data would be better. However, if you do have something like uh, the log p score that is sort of um, just a rule of how molecules work or something like that, and you believe in it and you think it's good, then you're going to get there faster than if you can build that structure in. So like if you try to tra train GPD-2, do we have the compute resources to really 
you know, uh, crawl a 45 million web pages and then take a gigabytes, gigabytes model, most people don't, can't scale that much. Um, and it's a question of whether it's even environmentally responsible uh, to scale that much and not do something more efficient. So um, it's a big debate. Uh, I don't want to necessarily come down on one side or the other. I think in small data regimes where there's good known structure, building it in can be helpful. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, did you perform some modeling of uh, maybe molecular interaction? I mean, it would be the only ultimate validation of the method that it can re regenerate valid molecules which are target for something. That, I did not do that. So the question was, did I uh, evaluate the molecule interactions of the generated molecules, you mean? Yes. Yeah. No, I did not do that. So I was collaborating on this paper with just deep learning people. We don't know what we're doing with molecules. So we could have used some more collaborators from like the Broad to help us out. Um, so that would be some good follow-up work, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, can you clarify what the action space in your reinforcement learning formulation? Great question, yeah. So what's the action space in the reinforcement learning formulation? It's the possible characters that can go into a smile sequence in the drug uh, thing, and it's just notes in the music thing. The music thing we had to do, actually perfecting the action space was one of the ways we got the RNN to even work in the beginning. You have to have like a note on, note off uh, action um, to get the timing right. Um, yeah, but the details are in the paper if you're curious, yeah. Okay, um, we're almost out of time. So I have another paper I was gonna present, but I don't think I can get through all of it. So should I do a bit of it, or what do you guys think? Uh, I think we can go into about five minutes. Do you have about 10 minutes? Okay, um, we, we'll breeze through this a little bit. I think uh, this is in my most recent work. It's on multi-agent deep reinforcement learning. Um, so why this fits in with the generalization thing is intrinsic motivation is a way to try to get RL to generalize in a meaningful way. So. Reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning, you've seen some successes that might have been pretty popular. So like for example, AlphaGo that I mentioned or doing all these Atari games. Um, but what's really disappointing is that usually you actually have, like even to play Atari, you have totally separate networks trained on Space Invaders and trained on Montezuma's Revenge, right? And so you're, you're really not getting any sort of generalization. You're just overfitting arguably to the specific reward function of a specific game. And that's not that interesting. So instead of relying on the points in a game, could you develop a general reward function that would guide you to learn in multiple different environments? So that's what an intrinsic motivation is. So people have looked at this before. Some approaches this, uh, are to make like an agent feel curious. So if it discovers a part of the world that it wasn't able to predict well, it should be biased to go back there. And that actually can work pretty well. Um, empowerment is giving the agent a bias to want to be able to manipulate its environment. So it wants to be able to be in a position where it's able to take actions that will affect the environment. Um, so these are some previous approaches to intrinsic motivation. But if I ask like, what motivates people, I don't think it's entirely just um, curiosity and a drive for power. That seems a little impoverished. So I think what motivates people very strongly is other people. So if I were looking around and you guys were looking at me like this audience here, I think I'd be pretty motivated to go to the next slide. Uh, I think it's a pretty powerful factor. Um, and if you don't believe me, there's a ton of research on this. Uh, social learning is arguably uh, something that's really critical to why I'm standing here talking to you about deep learning today uh, because of cultural evolution. So the question here is, could we uh, build some type of social learning into uh, a multi-agent reinforcement learning system? So you have multiple different AI agents in the same system. Could they somehow learn from each other? So this is only a very basic approach to this, the, just one idea. Um, but what we're doing here is we're giving agents an intrinsic social motivation for having a causal influence on another agent's actions. So if uh, an agent is able to do something that causes another agent to change his behavior, it gets a reward. Um, why do we focus on doing this? Well, one thing is that we really wanted to do something on the action level. We wanted to be able to let the agents uh, train independently. So prior approaches to multi-agent reinforcement learning, uh, they are able to view other agents' reward functions or they're able to share the weights or whatever. But this, I think, is a bit unrealistic um, because if you want to do an applica a multi-agent application uh, like self-driving cars where you have like a Tesla car and a Waymo car on the road, they're not going to be able to observe each other's proprietary re reward function or whatever. They're only gonna be able to observe whether the car turned left, what, like what actions it's actually taking in the environment. So if you do this on the action level, you're able to train independently while still learning from other agents. 
And we also think that if agents are ever going to learn to cooperate, then they're going to have a high degree of influence between their actions. So if you think about two agents that are like cooperating to lift a heavy box, if they're going to do it successfully, if one agent lifts the box faster, the other agent is going to have to lift the box faster as well. So there's this degree of influence between them. Um, this is the approach we took. Uh, how does it actually work? I'll do a really quick version. So uh, you start with your standard RL agent that looks at the environment and has like some convolutional layers and LCM is outputting your RL uh, policy and value function. And then you just augment this with a supervised model that predicts the actions of other agents in the environment. And, and so what you do is, based on your own past action and everyone else's action, you try to predict what the other agents are going to do in the next time step. What's the next action they're going to take? And what's cool about that is it allows you to uh, plug in a counterfactual action into your own model. So the agent can simulate, like, if it had, if I basically asked, like, if I had taken this other action at this time step, how do I predict that would have affected agent B's behavior? So I can simulate my effect on the other agent. And what that allows you to do is uh, sample a bunch of counterfactual actions from your own policy, say, here's all the things I possibly could have done or I would, was willing to do at the last time step, and then I predict the other agent's action given all of those counterfactuals, and I sum over it to get the marginal policy of the other agent. So this is basically, what would the other agent do if I weren't, didn't exist, if I wasn't doing anything? And then I can look at the divergence from the agent's marginal policy to its policy condition on my action, and I can see how much that differs. So if, those, if what the other agent uh, is going to do differs a lot when conditioning on my action from its general policy, then I know that I have more influence on that agent. Um, and the idea is to give this as a reward to agent A. So it gets a reward for being influential. Okay. Um, this uh, very complicated uh, graph shows that this is actually measuring the causal influence of agent A on agent B, um, because you can see if you're into causal reasoning, there are no backdoor paths between the action of agent A at time step t and the action of agent B at time step t plus one because they're blocked by these collider nodes. So I'll just gloss over that. I don't know if anyone cares about causal reasoning. But um, we also want to show that, oh, I guess maybe you guys do. You do. OK, OK. Uh, sorry. OK, OK. Um, we also show that uh, the causal influence reward is related to the mutual information between agents' actions. So you can see the reward is here. The full mutual information, you have to sum over all the states and all the actions that A can take. But actually, as you're generating a bunch of random trajectories and random episodes of the environment, you're effectively doing a Monte Carlo estimation of exactly that. You're taking a lot of samples of the state and a lot of samples of the actions. And so in expectation over your reinforcement learning model where you keep randomly sampling, you're getting the mutual information between their actions. So you're basically saying agents should maximize the mutual information between their actions, which is another reason why we think this could help with cooperation or coordination, if you will. Um, so in expectation, uh, the influences of mutual information, we think of this as kind of a novel form of social empowerment. So we talked about uh, empowerment, being an agent wants to be able to maximize its influence on the environment. This is like an agent wants to maximize its influence on other agents. Um, and uh, the issue with this, though, is who's already thought of the criticism that Wait, if I just want to be influential, what means I have to be nice? Yeah, OK. So if I want to influence another agent, perhaps I could just get in its way. And that's going to cause it to change its action. Uh, and, and then I've influenced it in a, in a detrimental way. So to test this reward, we tested in these sequential social dilemma environments where the problem that we're looking at is specifically uh, cooperation. So these are like a kind of temporally and, and spatially extended prisoner's dilemma where uh, each agent is always greedily motivated to defect. So what I mean by that is, in this plot, you can see that um, I'm looking at the reward of an individual agent, depending on the number of other agents that are either cooperators, meaning they're being helpful in the environment, or they're defectors. And what that means is like, for example, this is like a tragedy of the commons game, where you get points for har harvesting apples, but if you harvest them too quickly, the apples are depleted and don't grow back. So if you're greedy, you can harvest a bunch of apples, but that hurts everyone because you'll all get less apples in the future, right? Um, so uh, you can see here that the agent will almost always get more reward if it defects on the other agents, if they are cooperating. But of course, if everyone follows that strategy, no one gets any reward. So that's why it's a so so social dilemma. It's very hard for the agents to learn to cooperate with each other. Um, but it turns out, oh, uh, this kind of gives away the punchline, but uh, if you train with social influence, we actually see the agents are performing better 
than uh, the baseline agents, even if they also are able to model other agents' actions. Um, so how is it that this is actually helping agents cooperate? Oh, and this is actually beating prior work. I'll just gloss through that, go really quickly. How is it actually helping agents cooperate? Well, in this example, what you're seeing here is this purple agent was trained with the influence reward. It's the only one that was. And you see it's behaving a little differently than the other agents. While they search around when there's no food and continue looking for these apples, it just holds still. And in fact, if we look into it, it only actually uses two moves to navigate the map ever. So why is it doing that? Well, it turns out uh, that it only ever moves to navigate the map when there's food available and the rest of the time it holds still. So what that allows it to do is the environment is partially observable. So here we see this yellow agent can only see what's in this red square, but it's able to understand what action the purple agent is taking. When the purple agent chooses to move, which it only does if there's food, then it indicates to this yellow agent that there must be food present that it can't see. So effectively, it's learning to communicate via its actions about the presence of food in the environment and thus gain influence. And we see this happen again when it doesn't move and reveals there's no apples. Um, it's communicating about the present food via its actions, kind of like a little bee waggle dance happening there. So essentially, rewarding it for having influence, uh, uh, encourage it to learn to communicate, which we think is really fascinating. Um, so the next thing we did was train it explicitly to communicate with influence. Agents have a ch uh, cheap talk communication channel where they can send symbols to other agents, and they get influence for sending a symbol that helps the other agent, or sending a symbol that the other agent uses to change its behavior. Um, I'll just, this prior approach to having agents have a cheap talk communication channel doesn't really work. Uh, often they don't learn to use it effectively. But we see that when we reward them for having influential communication, they not only get better scores at cooperating, um, they have more meaningful communication protocols where the uh, mutual information is higher. Um, but my favorite result is actually this. The influential communication removes the problem that we were discussing earlier about uh, being able to influence an agent in a damaging way. Because agents are free to ignore anything you're saying to them. So you're talking on the cheap talk channel, they don't have to use that information at all. They can just go about their business. The only way they're going to, and they're only trained to maximize their own reward. So the only way they're going to use the information you're putting on the cheap talk channel is if it's going to help them get their own reward. And we see this backed up in these, uh, and by the way, these are repeated interactions. So just FYI, you could lie, but then you would lose influence over time. But because the agents are playing with the same agents over time, then we see this not happening. And what we see is that agents who are more easily influenced, in other words, they are influenced more by what's coming over the channel, tend to get higher individual reward. So we think this helps validate the hypothesis that meaningful information is coming over the channel. Um, here's a bunch of random seeds showing that it works consistently. Um, I just want to say, uh, we mentioned already that whether the influence is pro-social could depend on the environment. Um, uh, however, communication may be a cheap and easy way to influence others while still obtaining your own reward. Um, and then uh, via influence via a cheap talk communication channel should benefit the listener, but only if the agents are interacting repeatedly, otherwise you could lie. Um, so in conclusion, uh, this is a unified method for promoting cooperation and communication, and you can use it to allow agents to learn socially from each other while still training independently. Okay, one minute over. Yeah, question. So how, how diverse are these agents? Like, are they all using the underlying, same underlying algorithm? Yeah. Yeah, it seems to me diversity would be absolutely critical here. So something, I don't see something. That's a really great question. So in this paper, each agent uses the exact same architecture. They don't share the weights. They learn independently. Um, but it, it is true that, like, they have the same algorithm. However, one thing that really came out of DeepMind recently that I was fascinated by, I don't know if you followed their whole StarCraft thing, what they found is that in order to get a, an agent that could reliably beat the best humans, it had to train against a diverse pool of other agents. So it had to train against many different agents that all had their own intrinsic motivations, and those intrinsic motivations had to be sufficiently different so that they developed different strategies. And then only when that agent played against all these different strategies was it able to be robust and, and play against humans. So I thought that was a really fascinating finding. Yeah. So diversity is important, yes, I, I agree. So I think in the interest of time and get breakfast, we'll get that. And here, thank you so much, Tasha. Yeah, thank you. So this is, um, this is great for me to be here. Um, 
we have a whole series of, these are clinical studies, so we're actually in clinical settings, uh, and we're using algorithms, and any feedback you can give us can really influence how we go forward. Uh, so a lot of this talk is about the challenges we're confronting as we go through this. Um, I just want to emphasize, uh, there's, if you're interested in mobile health and you're interested in RL, this is a phenomenal test bed for uh, RL, mobile health, and it's a test bed in which you can have, you can work directly in the clinical sphere, not, uh, not only in um, more um, projects in-house, you can work also in the clinical setting as well. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that shortly. Okay, uh, I wanna go over mobile health so that we're all on the same page. Uh, so what is the, when you're talking about mobile health, you're really talking about behavioral science, behavior change and maintenance of that behavior change. And if you know, uh, if you've ever followed this area, this domain, you know that uh, unfortunately our behaviors account for most of the morbidity that we suffer. The vast majority of the morbidity that you see in the states, in the US, are due to our behaviors. Um, so uh, the idea here is how can you promote behavior change and how can you maintain that change? And uh, the focus I'm gonna take here is how can the app help you help yourself? help you achieve your long-term goals, that is recovery. For example, here's some examples, recovery from addictions, uh, alcohol, drug use, uh, avoid heart attacks, that's what we're, we're gonna be focusing on here today, maintain independence. In general, our focus, our lab's focus is on managing chronic illnesses, so people who have multiple issues they're trying to manage. Uh, so we have both this goal, but we also have a second goal, and these goals sometimes are at odds, and you'll see me close this talk, how I explain how they're a little at odds, and that is to further uh, causal behavioral science, to be able to uh, enhance science to design future studies. Okay, so in mobile health, there's two types of treatments. In fact, every app uh, normally has a ton of pulls. So pulls are where you recognize you need help. Say, for example, you're in recovery support for alcoholism. You recognize you're feeling a lot of craving. You go to your app and you see the nearest in time and space alcoholic anonymous meeting that you can go to. That's a pull. Uh, so almost all apps have tons of pulls. And I won't even talk about pull, pulls here. What I'm gonna talk about are pushes. Pushes are where you interrupt the person as they go about their life and you attempt to provide support. The problem with pushes is, well, the advantage is that people, the user doesn't have to recognize that he or she needs support. The system might recognize that and therefore help that person. Uh, the problem with that is you're interrupting that person in their life. Uh, so the iterogenic effects can be profound. So when we talk about experimentation, we're always thinking about pushes, pretty much. And it's because of this, it, there's just a strong reason to optimize. And that reason is there's both positive but very strong negative impact. Um, so I'll, I'll go over what micro-randomized trials are. So these are a combination, these combine both uh, ideas from RL as well as ideas from classical experimental design that are ideas that are used throughout industry and across the world. So uh, I use the word factorial experimental design and I'm gonna show you an example shortly. Uh, the sequential experimentation can use online forecasting R and R reinforcement learning, and how you might use online forecasting to do this sequential experimentation, this is very much in its infancy. Like we have an algorithm right now in the field, it's so rough, it's so coarse, it's unreal. So the potential to make an impact, to improve this experimentation is, is enormous. Uh, you normally have multiple components of your app we call them treatment factors. They occur at different time scales. 
They're targeting different re uh, rewards. I'm using Natasha's language, rewards. You could think of them as near-time outcomes that you want to influence. Uh, there's almost always some sort of soft, probabilistic budget on the burden. So uh, when you think about experimentation, RL, or online uh, use uh, to improve experimentation, it's constrained. Um, and this is because of these pro this problem that uh, in real life, if you roll this out in a clinical setting, uh, you can't pay people a lot. Well, there are some insurance companies that can do some payments, but in general, you can't pay people a lot, and uh, people will delete the app. Uh, and at the end, or intermediate, you want to uh, be able to do causal inference. So here's a study. This was run by Kaiser in Seattle. This is not a research study. It was run um, because they have a, a lot of uh, patients they give bariatric surgery to. Uh, and then within a year, they've regained their weight. And this is horrendous, because surgery is not innocuous. This is not. Uh, and so the idea was, how can you provide support to these people so that hopefully they'll be less likely to regain their weight by the end of a year? So there's a baseline fact, two baseline factors that are randomized. So think of a, 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 a four sales, two by two factorial design. So that's at baseline. It has to do with how you set exercise goals, the amount of variation in the setting of the goals. There's very interesting behavioral science here, actually, but I'll, go, I'll gloss over that. Uh, and then every evening, there's, I mean, I'm sorry, every morning, there's a randomization about how you remind the participant to track their food through the day. You want to understand uh, how often. You don't want to remind them necessarily every day. And then within a day, at five times a day, uh, it's user-specific times, they can be ra uh, randomized to a tailored uh, text message that gives them a suggestion about how they can be active in the moment. These are really short suggestions, like if they only take like two or three minutes to actuate. Uh, so you see already the multiple time scales here. Two factors that are at baseline, one factor that's every day, and then another factor that's within a day, multiple times per day. Each one targets different rewards, different near-time outcomes. Of course, the whole outcome, at the end of the day, you want people a year later to have managed their weight successfully. So there's a distal outcome always. Um, this is, that study's finished. Um, this study is in the field right now. This is a bench research study. Uh, this is with uh, a variety of wearables uh, that, uh, a, it's, this is part of a big engineering team. Uh, they, they developed wearables, chest bands, and wristbands. Uh, and it's a 10-day study starting with the day someone quits. And every minute during that day, we uh, assess whether or not it would be appropriate to remind them to use their mindfulness exercises they've been trained in. Uh, it's not appropriate if they're currently driving example. There can be other reasons why it might not be appropriate. But if, it's, is it, if it is appropriate, we look to see whether or not they're currently classified as physiologically stressed. Uh, if they are, uh, if we can't make a classification, they're deemed not available as well, okay, if you're used to uh, physiological stress classifications. This actually, this whole classifier is based on, it's based on a, a support vector machine, but uh, it uses a lot of other um, smoothing, this is real online and real proactively, so it has to be made very stable. Uh, and it turns out people are not stressed that much, even when they're trying to quit smoking. It's amazing. So we have to, we do one randomization strategy within the group that are, within the times, the minutes at which they're classified as stressed, and we use another randomization strategy within the minutes that they're not classified as stressed. This is a setting in where you have a constrained optimization algorithm because you want to get around one and a half times per day you want to intervene on average, so around three times every two days. But you want to spread them out across the times they're stressed. So you don't want to deliver your budget early in the day. And so we had to develop a forecaster for this. Um, very vanilla forecaster. I, I'll only speak a little bit about that again, but the area for improvement is vast. Um, that's all I got to say here. <laughs> um, 
Okay, so what does data look like from a micro-randomized trial? So for me, a micro-randomized trial uh, is any kind of setting where we're doing uh, exploration. And I think of that as uh, randomization. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to focus on a particular factor, say, the five times a day activity, whether or not we provide activity suggestion. So you can imagine on each individual, you have a time series, you have the context uh, that's accruing between your time points, you have the action that you can take at each time point, and then you have your near time reward. And I just give some other words. Uh, if you're in control engineering, you'd often talk about utility instead of reward. Um, so we saw this in the last talk. And we call these micro-randomized trials uh, and view them as part of experimental uh, studies. Uh, so what are some of the challenges to RL when you're in this world where you want to run these studies with clinical populations? So just to, uh, I, if you were at the last talk, you have some idea of this already, but I'm just going to review. Uh, so what are RL, so when I, I'm a statistician, when I look at an RL algorithm, what do I think? I think sequential experimentation. That's what I'm thinking. And the goal here is to learn how to best select the action after observing context, and you have some criterion you're trying to satisfy, and you want to often uh, uh, maximize uh, a sum of rewards, possibly discounted here. I have a discount rate. And in my case, it's going to be constrained as well. It's not unconstrained. OK, um, so in our world, the world of mobile health, our state space is indeed large, but th that's not the problem. I mean, OK, so you have sensor data coming in. That's all wonderful. The problem is that the domain science is really immature, and so we don't often know what we need to know. And so what? what happens is it appears as if we have non-stationarity. So it's non-station, it's, it's as if someone returns to what we view as the same state, but in reality they're not in the same state. And so we get this appearance of non-stationarity. This is one of the challenges. How do you manage that if you're going to put this into a clinical setting? Uh, we also have this variety of stakeholders. I already mentioned that. Uh, we want to uh, facilitate causal inference. Uh, high variance between users, this is not surprising in the clinical setting because now you're uh, intervening in the person's everyday life and the amount of noise, the things that are going on that affect their ability to be responsive is quite high. The problem, of course, there is you get this very slow le learning rate. Um, and I'll speak a little bit this, about this. Natasha's talk was really great for this because uh, one of the, somebody asked a question that's directly related to something we're working on. And I, I'm going to come back to that, a guy on that side of the room. So uh, this is great for me. Um, another thing, too, is if you're looking between uh, sending an action that is like a notification or a message, versus not sending. So you might have multiple types of notifications. I'm just going to ignore that for the moment. Let's say I send a notification that's supposed to help you versus I don't send. In that setting, any kind, uh, the action is likely to have a positive impact or at least a non-negative impact near time on you. So like if I send you an activity suggestion, you may not respond. But if you do, you're probably going to walk more. You're not going to walk less because I sent you an activity suggestion. The problem is the delayed rewards, the delayed impact of sending that action is almost always negative. Now, of course, we would love it for you to form great habits and start exercising in future, but the signal that has the biggest, the biggest signal is usually the negative signal. That is, we've aggravated you and you uh, delete the app are um, you habituate, which happens in psychology. If you know, if you have a background in psychology, you know that if you have repeated stimuli, after a while, even if the person is motivated, they just don't see the stimuli anymore, and that's called habituation. So it's, it's a combination of both of these, and it's hard for me to disentangle them 
but both are operating in this, this world. So the delayed effects are mostly negative, the ones you can detect, and the immediate effects are mostly positive, the ones you can detect. I'm talking about the high signal to noise ratio. So this is a big challenge, because if you're not careful, you'll just want to treat all the time, which is completely foolishness. OK, so I'm now going to talk to you about heart steps. So V1 is done. V2 is going into the field like within the next two weeks. So it's a miracle I'm here right now, to be honest. Uh, so um, and uh, uh, V1 was with sedentary individuals. V2 will be uh, is with it's run. It's going to be run at Kaiser uh, with people who uh, have uh, hypertension, and there's an effort to get them to change their behavior so they can avoid medication. Okay. Um, so uh, this is the one we'll use the data to design this study. And this study has, uh, V2 has multiple treatment components, and I'll focus mainly on the, R the activity suggestions, and there we'll have an RL, we have an RL algorithm that we're designing using the data from this study. And then the last study will be a year-long study, so you can imagine the concerns we're, we're worried, how many concerns we have. Okay, so here's the first study. It was just 42 days, so it was really short. Um, and so here there were only, there were tons of pulls, um, but I'm not gonna, none of them, they're not shown on this slide. There were only two uh, factors that we randomized, pushes. One was this five times a day. These were times related to a person's work schedule. Uh, and um, we first ascertained uh, whether they were available for treatment and then if they were, they were randomized so that on average three times a day they'd get a, a tailored suggestion. These tailored suggestions, the content of the suggestion comes from sensor data. Okay. So it's not vanilla. The content of the suggestion is not vanilla. It's, and um, then every evening they were also randomized to um, pl uh, plan their activity for the next day. Okay, so um, let me back up a little bit. There's no alg RL algorithm going on here. There's no budgeted budgets going on. It's just flat out exploration. Uh, all the randomization probabilities were constant. So we, in the language of RL, we were using a behavior policy and an incredibly simplistic behavior policy for this particular study. So simple that on average, three times a day, you got a message <coughs> To, uh, that was about being active in the moment, and on, on average, every other day, you got a prompt to plan the next day's activity. Actually, there were different kinds of prompts. I'm just not showing this. There were a lot more, there was a lot more going on, but um, I just won't go over that today, because I want to go to heart steps, too. How many people were involved? This study, we sized it. We have a sample size calculator for these studies, because there's a primary analysis, because we have to write a grant to fund them, and there were only 37. Uh, we did, a, we have a sample size calculator to do a causal inference analysis at the end of the study, and we sized it, and that's how we knew we needed, we needed like 35, and we tried to get recoup 40, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, and the primary analysis in these kinds of studies is really simple. It's like, did this message have any impact on average across the study, in this case, on your subsequent 30-minute step count. That's the word, in words, that's what it is. And that's something that's very amenable to a clinical. Um, and then after that, you want to ask, well, what kind of messages? Do different messages work better at different contexts and so on? But those are all secondary analyses. Should I think about the randomization at the level of, you know, Person through or the level of hour or it's, it depends on the factor. So this is at person day level. This is at person time point level, right. five times a day. So in the next study, I'll still call it a micro randomized trial. It's just that the the probabilities here are being biased by the RL algorithm. And then there'll be another, there's another uh, anti-sedentary suggestion, and those probabilities are being, there's a constrained optimization problem going on there. So, but I still t say it's micro-randomized. It's just a randomized trial. We even know the randomization probabilities, because we designed them. So you 
genetics, a lot of the best mathematics came out of like people breeding animals. Um, yeah. Uh, and I feel like here you're you're trying. It's almost like A/B testing. I mean, it is. there's so much investment in getting people to buy things. Uh, for example, uh -huh. do, you, do you feel like that field has a lot to offer? Um, yeah, and I've given talks where uh, at like B schools because they're very interested in this. So a lot of the A-B testing is between people. And actually, A-B testing, it comes out of clinical trials. Uh, some of the A-B testers don't realize that. But uh, A-B testing was developed like eons ago in clinical trials where you were going through different chemotherapies, and you, ran, you differentially randomized from one person to the next trying to decide which chemotherapies to randomize the, the next person to. So the difference here is it's within person, which means it's much more like RL than it is like classical AB. So I'm sure some people who are doing AB testing are moving to the within person randomization, but then they really should go to the RL li liter literature. Uh, maybe they have a different viewpoint, but you know what I mean, that's my, yeah. Yeah, A-B testing in clinical trials has been going on like 100 years or something. Uh, okay, so I just want to show you the action that's being provided here. Um, so what happens is this happened, uh, this, it, it, your phone lights up, it pings, and on my notification, on the front, I got this message in the morning. It was actually a pretty cold day. It was the day I was going to work, uh, and I copied it, and it just, it talks about, it recognizes it's not so bad. This was really cold weather, okay? So it's trying to get my mind on the right. And, maybe, and it's right before I'm going to work, so maybe you could walk today or just park, and then I can get rid of the message by thumbs down. I didn't find it actionable. Thumbs up, I liked it. Or in our settings, we also allow people to turn off messages uh, because we want the user to have agency. Um, and essentially, uh, again, I, I do want to emphasize uh, this happens all through RL uh, in much more complex ways. But here, I, I, the, act, the set of actions does depend on the context. So if you're currently driving, you cannot get a notification. We can't get it past the IRB. Uh, uh, and then all of these suggestions were about new walking activities. So if you were currently walking, you would never get a suggestion from us. Now, in another study we ran, it was about continuing your current walk. So then we only randomized you if you were currently walking. It just depends on the action speed. Anyway. Um, so I just want to give you the results. So we were, we were very fortunate. Um, it, the study worked out really well. Um, so uh, early in the study, um, we got over a, uh, people who are sedentary. Uh, these are very sedentary people. Um, they get around 250 steps in a 30-minute window. So we more than doubled their step count early in the study. But by three weeks out, it had pretty much gone away, that effect. So there was this negative time trend. Um, and uh, that already now you should be non-stationary. I mean, you know, what's going on here? What, what proxies? And there wasn't anything that picked up that time trend. Uh, it was very strong. OK, some, here are some of the features that predict succeeding 30-minute step, step count. So we're in a very simplistic world, uh, time and study. That's what that was about. Uh, how many, what's the recent dose? How many times have we bothered you? Locate Your current location had a big impact, actually. How variable your step count was in the prior 60-minute window. That was quite interesting, the more variable. Um, yeah, and then prior 30-minute step count, and so on. So these are predicting 30-minute step count, regardless of whether or not you were received a message. And then um, which, which variables uh, really interacted with the responsivity to that message? Well, we already, already mentioned time and study, recent dose, how often we've been bothering you, uh, location, uh, and how vari if the more variable your step count was in the hour around that time over the prior week, the more responsive you were. It was quite interesting. Um, anyway, so all of this was important for us because we're going to the next heart steps and we're thinking about what features are we going to put in this RL algorithm. Um, 
Okay. So uh, for this particular factor, as I said, there's many factors that are being, there's multiple factors, uh, five factors that are being experimented with in uh, V2, but I'm just going to focus on this one and whether or not we uh, provide this tailored activity suggestion. And as I mentioned, the content of the activity suggestion is always tailored on sensor data. Um, so suppose we, we say we want, to, we want to maximize the summer rewards over, now this is a three month study, not a two month, um, not a 42 day study. Four time points per day, that it's set according to the user's work schedule. So these are all people who have hypertension and the goal is to help them be active so they don't end up on drugs. That's the objective. And the reward is the 30 minute step count for this particular factor, intervention component. So uh, what we end up, we're putting in and uh, is what I would call a butchered bandit. And it actually, maybe I shouldn't call it a butchered bandit because um, I'm thinking of your talk. I loved your talk. Uh, anyway, because um, it has some relationship to that, and you, we'll see. Okay, I just want everybody to be on the same page here. I wasn't sure how many people knew about RL algorithms, so I kind of walk us through it. And also, I'm in a very uh, constrained world because I'm so much in the clinical setting. So, um, uh, so the mean reward, this is the mean of the reward given current context and current action. And in our setting, A is one or zero. One, you got a message, zero, you didn't. Um, so what happens in a bandit? At each t you march along in time. At each time point, the algorithm inputs the current features on that individual at that time. So this is, a, in, in heart steps, this is a variety of sensor data from the phone, uh, from the wearable, and some self-report data. So it's the standard setting in this world. And then the algorithm selects a treatment, send a message versus not. Then after that, you observe your reward. In our case, it's that 30-minute step count. And then you have your algorithm. What it does is it takes that context, that action, and that reward, and it updates this mean function. So you have some parameterized mean function, it updates those parameters, that's cool, and then it goes on to the next time point, and the algorithm uses that updated mean reward to, in some way, select the next treatment. And then you just continue on cycling through time. And different banded algorithms use that mean reward, that updated mean reward, in different ways to select of the next treatment. Okay, so what we're going to, I'm going to start off with what a, a linear Thompson sampling bandit, and we're going to make it more complex as we go through. Um, so the first thing we're going to do, when I say linear, I mean we have some features of context and action, and we look at a linear combination of the features and action. This will get more complex. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll, I, it's linear, I, I say uh, Thompson sampling, the minute I say that, you should cue Bayesian. We're gonna be, a, we're gonna be Bayesians. Uh, so you can think of a very simple GP, uh, Gaussian process model, but it could be much more complicated if you want, but uh, nonetheless, think Gaussian process. Um, so we're gonna have a Gaussian prior on these weighted, uh, we have that, encoded in the coefficients, then given the current concept, current action and current reward, we update the posterior distribution of these coefficients. It's great, it's all conjugate, so you get a, a Gaussian distribution um, of these etas with some posterior mean, posterior covariance structure. Then what you do is you randomize to the next action according to the posterior probability that a, that action is best. So all the Bayesian paradigm does is it tells you how to randomize. This is a wonderful thing. And the randomization is intelligent randomization. One would hope if you did a good job with your model in the sense that it biases the randomization in favor of the action that appears to perform best in that particular context. So here's, now we're going to go through the challenges and see how we took that basic vanilla version and started to alter it. That's what's coming up. But, uh, yeah. Okay, so 
we have this high with end user variance. And we've seen this in study after study after study, not necessarily in physical activity, but in multiple studies in these, this domain. What do we do about that? Well, of course I want to go full RL because I, you know, I just, I'm in love with RL. But that's the bottom reason why I want to go full RL, I have to be honest with you. But the problem is, uh, so if you're, if you're not familiar with RL, I'm going to give you a, a, an intuitive way to think about it. Think of a linear regression. In a bandit, the outcome variable is just your next 30-minute step count. In full RL, the outcome variable, the dependent variable, the y, is the next 30-minute step count plus a prediction of what's going to happen in the future under the policy you're on right now. The more noisy that prediction is, the more noise you have put into your algorithm. The less you diffuse, the more you diffuse the signal you're getting. So a, what does a bandit do? A bandit ignores that future prediction entirely. It discounts it away. It just focuses on that next 30 minutes. So it's a gross regularization. I mean, really gross. Uh, so, so that's one reason to start off with a bandit in a very high noise setting, is to, to regularize. Essentially what we're doing is we're trading bias and variance. We're clearly getting bias in the setting. We know we have big negative delayed effects, right? Um, so also, we're going to use a low dimensional parameterization of our mean reward. Uh, and it is going to be, it's going to get more sophisticated than this, but it's still in the linear world of features. So uh, if I have more data, I'll have more and more closer to a more Gaussian process model. And we'll use a Gaussian prior. Why are we using a Gaussian prior? I don't believe in Gaussian priors. Gaussian priors are equivalent to L2 regularization. They shrink all the coefficients. And the, the we'll, we'll have them shrink the coefficients to the values of eta from heart steps V1. And we use, we take the variance of that prior from heart steps V1. So we, the shrinkage, it's all, it's an informative prior. Um, and that's sort of like what Natasha, this is like the transfer learning. Natasha is just low level, I'm in the low level. Anyway, it's transfer learning, but it's, I just love. Anyway, so the other issue is non-stationarity. And here, actually, we, we dealt with non-stationarity in two ways. And we ended up, uh, this is one way. Uh, uh, so I already mentioned this, and it has a lot to do with the infancy of the domain science. We don't even know, so we can't use a POM if you're interested in partially observed Markov decision process. That would be my natural go-to kind of scenario. But there I have to know what my latent states are. And there are some ideas in this direction, and it's very interesting, and I think there's a lot of room for this. But unfortunately, we got to also remember that this is a domain in which in five years, they'll have new latent states that they'll have realized are really important that they didn't realize at this time. Uh, so uh, how might you deal with this non-stationarity? In, uh, instead of using just a fixed prior on your regression coefficients, you use a Gaussian process prior. And essentially, you put an AR, we, put, we, were, we investigated using an AR1 model on our coefficients. Um, so that's the, what does this do practically? Practically what this does is it exponentially discounts the past. So there is past data. So there's a price for this, because you get more variance. Um, there's really a bias variance trade-off going on here. Just like in the farmer challenge, there was a bias variance trade-off. There's another bias variance trade-off here as well. Um, OK, so again, the immediate effects, I already discussed this. If you're looking at actions between sending I bother you versus I don't bother you. That's the contrast I'm looking at right now. Then I have to deal with this issue of primarily positive effects in the near term and primarily detectable negative effects in the delayed world. So I don't want to always learn, I don't want to accidentally have my algorithm learn always treat. So what do we do? What we do is we do something akin to what Natasha was telling us to do. What we did was we built a, 
it's different. We add something to that reward function. We're uncomfortable ha adding a full-scale prediction of the future rewards. That's too high variance. We want to provide something that has lower variance to the reward. It still predicts the future, but it has lower variance than a full-scale prediction, full-scale RL prediction. So what we did was we built a simplistic MDP, Markov decision process, in which the only dynamic uh, state variable is dose, and it's evolving deterministically. And all the other states, we act as if they're IID. So we're, again, we're trading bias and variance again, but we get a, uh, and, and so this gives us this proxy for these total future rewards. Think of that, the thing you're going to add to your reward function. Um, we also update this proxy at every point in time. So every time, uh, as the trial goes on, every time, at every decision, to, every time we, we estimate our newest reward function. And that newest reward, that updated reward function, is the reward function that becomes the base for this proxy. So the proxy is updated every time. It's not like we just have one proxy and we just go with it. I'm not going to really talk to you about that, because I had something else I wanted to show you. And I'm going to. Um, so um, the other big challenge here is um, in the, in, this, in the world we're in, um, because we want to be able to do causal inferences, uh, we have to ensure, well, and we also have non we have to be concerned about non-stationarity. We always want to have some level of exploration. We don't want to accidentally end up selecting an action with probability zero or probability one. You know, we don't want to get too close to one or zero. Uh, because that will cause all kinds of problems with causal inference. Uh, we need continual exploration. You can't learn if you don't explore. That's the bottom line. So that was one of the reasons why we go for a, uh, uh, a Thompson sampling uh, type algorithm or a randomized value function type um, setting. But we actually uh, also, uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more because this is incredibly crude. The posterior probability of choosing the actions comes out, and then if it's too low or too high, we clip it. I mean, so awful. It's just so awful. I mean, it just makes me ill. But anyway, that's what we do. <laughs> and this allows us actually to size the studies, too, to determine the number of participants we need to guarantee the funder that will get a main, you know, a, a significant, uh, we can detect effects. Anyway, OK. So now, uh, and I'll talk to you about that disaster that uh, later. But anyway, so I just want to emphasize this mean reward function, the expected reward given current context and current action, is likely complex. And we saw Natasha; she's doing really cool stuff with deep learning. Uh, we we don't have our nor our world is just a high high noise world, and we only are going to have like in this study. I'm I really want seventy people. That will be a really big thing. Uh, so I just don't have the, I don't think I have the signal to, to, ha to estimate many parameters. On a practical side, is the main constraint there just financial at this point? Or is it, is there's, it hard to find? There's a certain number of eligible people? Is, what is right, that? it's two constraints. So like if I go, if, if I, go, I have studies like uh, similar to this with companies. They don't care about primary analyses. They get me a lot more users. They're all wellness people. It's a different population from people who are struggling with a chronic disorder. So first of all, we can't get as many people. Second of all, we have to write a grant to get the people. And we have to justify a primary analysis. So that, um, and the grant can't go over a certain amount per year, and you have all these stakeholders, so that restricts things as well. Um, let me think what else. Uh, but I would, what I'd really like to see is something, okay, I'm gonna get off track just for a second. But I keep thinking, like with this physical activity thing, maybe one could get, there are big data sets out there with wellness populations, where you could, say, train a deep learner, the lower level uh, layers, and maybe here we would just be uh, personal, uh, personalizing the upper layers. That would be one way to do this. Yeah. 
So, but the bottom line is, is in this study, we're not going to adjust many parameters. Oh, yeah. So, actually, what we're going to do, also because of this complexity, we're going to use an old idea that comes out of old clinic, uh, experimental design and econometrics. It's a very old idea, and it's incredibly helpful, it turns out. Uh, and it's, ca it's called contrast coding. And we're going to center, and we, we may, you know, we know these probabilities because our algorithm spits these, algor these probabilities out. We're going to center the treatment indicator. In our case, it's an indicator, but you can do this with when you have multiple kinds of treatments. That's not an issue. It's just here it's a treatment indicator. Uh, with the probability, with, so, so I'm going to take the treatment minus the probability that I give a treatment. You're going to see that on the next slide. And this is going to have all kinds of nice side effects. And I'm going to talk about that here. So what we're going to do is we're going to replace the mean of the reward, given current context and current action. Uh, I talked about it as a linear combination. We're going to replace it by this, func this type of a function. This is conceptual. So first, there'll be the part of the function that's uh, multiplied times the action minus the, out the probability with which we select that action. We'll always have that probability. It's from the Bayesian algorithm. Uh, and then we'll have some other term. Notice there's a subscript of t here. It's, so um, what happens here is that this part of the model is orthogonal to this part. So in the algorithm, uh, you can make guesses at this. They don't have to be correct. It can be non-stationary which is really nice. That's OK. It doesn't influence the action selection. So the, this, the role of this part of the model is to reduce variance, essentially. Um, as I said, it comes out of uh, classical econometrics, and some areas of clinical trials do this as well. Uh, and it's, the role of this is to reduce variance, and the role of this is to decide what action is best. Uh, and um, so we're going to. We're not going to guarantee that we have, we'll have some simple approximation for this, but it's not, net, in order to learn well, uh, we don't need a really good specification of this. What we really want to do is a good job here. So an experiment, if you go back to, uh, so this is another awful thing. It's completely at odds with the way we think in CS and machine learning. If you go back to classical experimental design, there's this notion that the higher the order effect it is, the more parsimonious, the more sparse it is. And that's being used here as well. So we don't expect this to be very high dimensional. And it's not because it isn't high dimensional. It act probably is. It's just we can't detect a high dimension. That's OK, so I just want to show you some of the analyses we, we did when we were planning this. This, this was built off the HeartSips V1. And here's an it. So it turns out, OK, there's a theoretical result. You can prove, you can reprove regret bounds uh, for Thompson samplers when you use action centering and when you don't. So if you have a non-stationary setup and you're using a banded algorithm and you don't uh, use action centering, then uh, the regret uh, uh, grows at order t, t where that's the time. And that was, at the time we did this, that was thought that was just the way it was going to have to be. If you were in a non-stationary world, the regret would grow at order t. It turns out that if you do this little bitty uh, correction, um, the regret grows at order square root t, the worst case regret. So all of a sudden, you're back in the standard regret scenario. Uh, even though you have, might have non-stationarity. So, and that, here's an uh, illustration of that. Here's the action standards. You can see the regret. The regret's on the y-axis. The decision times are on the x-axis. The regret is growing uh, much less than a t at rate t, whereas a standard Thompson sampling, it's growing at rate t. And in this setting, we didn't have, we only had a Gaussian prior. We didn't use the proxy. We didn't add anything to the reward. Um, but there's a problem here with all of this. And this is something I, I would be interesting to hear from Natasha if she's seen something similar. Uh, this is, and I had some indication that this happened from the A-B studies that are used in clinical trials. A lot of people are totally against using A-B studies 
to uh, go from randomizing one participant to the next in classical clinical trials. And the reason why they're very unhappy with this, don't, and they don't use it, it's not used that much, is because the variance. And I'm going to talk about that here, and you'll see it. OK, this is the exact same plot. It's just what we did was across these 500 simulated users, uh, this is the average, average regret. So that now what we do is we look at the other, upper 75th quantile. Uh, so the, the y-axis changes because I have to include that upper quantile here. And then the lower quantile, you can't even see it. It's kind of flat. That's the 25th quantile. Um, so here you have the red and the blue lines for the action center and the standard. They're, they look flat because of the scale of the y-axis. And you see the variation. So this is telling you that 25% of those users had a regret, say, let, let's just focus on action center, had a regret higher than this dashed blue line. This, this is not good. And that's a big problem. So when you roll this study out in a trial, you, you're, you could be in a setting where for you know, a good fraction of your users, you do a great job personalizing to that user. And 25% of them, well, you know, whatever. It, it's bad. And it's something that we need to confront. And I don't know. OK, so one of the things we're doing is we're, um, we, don't, we didn't know about Natasha, but we're following her anyway. Uh, we're, we're, uh, and this is related to the question someone on that side of the slide, um, si side of the room. We're using partial pooling with GP processes. OK, the guy asked about random effects. For you and me, that's Bayesian random effects. That's GP. Same thing. Okay, so it's fine. They can call it GPs. We'll call it a random effects model, a Bayesian random. It's the same thing. You just have to decide the dimensionality of your kernel, the complexity of your kernel. But that's what we're doing in this. So we, we're adding people to this study, and we'll pool with just that. The pro and that's to reduce this, this problem. There's another, so I'm now gotten off track, but it's because of Natasha's talk, and I liked it so much. There's another problem here, though. I want to allow people to do causal inference after the end of the study. What happens when I pool across people online in a clinical trial? I've made it so that my users now, my participants, are dependent. All of the standard causal inference, it violates. That's, it violates all. So at the same time, we're developing the algorithms to do standard causal inference when you do this pooling. And that's the reason why you haven't seen the pooling so far in clinical trials, is because standard causal inference methods are vi they depend on independence of the participants, and you don't have that. So there's, you want to learn faster. You don't want to hurt people, so you want to pool. But you want to advance science afterwards. So you have to manage that. Yeah. OK, I'm just going to go through some open questions. I've already kind of mentioned some open questions already. Um, so how do you operationalize all of this? We've got to, there's got to be some principles here, right? I'm ad hocering all over the place. Uh, so how do you, should I be thinking of tracking the best non-stationary policy? How do I? Mathematize that. What will be my criterion that I want to optimize in order to build an RL algorithm, which is tracking the best policy? Because that's all we really can do. In that year-long study, that's all we're going to really be able to do is track a policy. That would be our best case scenario. We want to allow intermittent off-policy inferences. Like every other week or so, we would like to be able to permit causal inference. So think off-policy um, learning. We want our RL algorithm, even if it's completely wrong, it's still doing randomization. We want to still be able to analyze the data. This is really important. You know? So, so the R, we cannot depend on the RL algorithm in order to do our causal inference. They, we don't want to intertwine that. We don't want to hurt our, our collaborators. So here's 
Um, this is something we've uh, just began working on. How do you design a study where your goal is, it's a constrained optimization problem. We want to maximize, fin uh, so minimize ti finite time t regret subject to a constraint, and the constraint is the power to detect a particular causal, uh, to test a particular hypothesis. How do you design a study in which you aim to personalize as much as you can, yet you have to manage, uh, you want to preserve power? Um, what we did instead was a poor man's version. We just clipped our exploration probabilities to ensure that we could answer our causal questions. But that was a poor man's version of a more principled approach. So this is one way that one might uh, attempt to move, is how do you design, how do you personalize yet learn, yet learn from everyone else in terms of science? Um, how do you deal with missing data? I mean, uh, this is this online thing. Um, so this is my last slide. Uh, I just want, so where are we going with our, our whole lab? What we're, the way, where we're going is we, our goal is to facilitate, say, Kaiser or VA, where they would actually roll out their app, and on that part of the treatment is an algorithm that is constantly personalizing. So it'll be one of the treatment components. So it's continual learning. Um, and these will always end up trading bias and variance um, because of these noisy settings. Okay, that's my last slide. Thanks. <laughs>